Uh, the first speaker is Jun Hu. He received his uh, PhD at the University of Michigan in 2014. That is just a little over two years ago. And for that, he has an enormous biblio bibliography already. Uh, he is currently a Clay Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, well, you can read the title. Well, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to speak here. And I'm going to talk something about hard left shift properties and Hodge Riemann relations. I hope you pardon my probably overly general title. Certainly, I will not going to and I will not be able to speak everything known about hard left shift properties and Hodge Riemann relations in so many different fields. The reason I put the title in that way, the, in fact, the only reason is to tell you that there is not only one hard left shift theorem, but there are many hard left shift theorems concerning vastly different mathematical objects. And same for the Hodge Riemann relations also. There are even conjectures that you would call hard left shift conjectures concerning certain objects that's still unknown. So, the hart lepsius property and the Hodge-Riemann relations are not theorem or theorems. Rather, they are a general pattern, rather strong and universal pattern. And I'm going to show you which is perhaps the most elementary instances which fall into this pattern the, uh, concerning the objects that you see in combinatorics. But before going into details of these examples of objects that find hard Lepschitz and Hodge Riemann, let me briefly recall you what these patterns are. So let's say X is your favorite mathematical object. And let's say, suppose it has a certain structure, maybe a geometric one, so that you have a natural notion of dimension. So let's say your X has dimension D. Then oftentimes, what you can do is the following. From X, you can associate a vector space, which oftentimes you call the cohomology of X, or it has other names also in different contexts, which is a graded vector space, say over the real numbers. And the grading goes from zero to the D, where D is the, your dimension of X. And it's not just any graded vector space, but it comes with two operators. So the first one is a bilinear pairing that I'm going to write by P. And it pairs an element in degree Q with an element in degree D minus Q, and it has values in the base field, say the real numbers. And the second operator that I'm going to write L goes from A to the Q to A to the Q plus 1. So it increases the degree by 1. And usually what you see is that this P and L, the linear maps, individually have nice properties. And they, when their action is combined together, they also satisfy certain rather remarkable properties. The first one is maybe the most familiar one that you have seen on many different cases. The first is the analog of Poincaré duality. It says that for every non-negative integer q, the pairing which pairs an element of degree q with an element with degree d minus q is non-degenerate for every q. This is what you expect from this pairing P that's given to you from the context or from the object X. The second pattern that you often see concerns the operator L, or more accurately, the compositions of the operator L that increases degree by one each time you apply it. It says that for every Q, the composition of the linear operator L, exactly d minus 2q times, 
so that the domain of your linear map is a to the q, and the target of your linear map is a to the d minus q, is always bijective. This is the expectation or the belief. If you have the right operators p and l. This is sometimes called the hard lepsha theorem for x. So, and I'm going to delay the discussion of the hodge riemann relations until the second talk, but let me just uh, briefly say that the hodge riemann relations for x in this uh, notation predict that the signature of the bilinear form, which is supposed to be symmetric, defined on a to the q with values in R, defined by saying that you're going to pair x1 and x2 by applying the Lepschitz operator that you see in the second item to the second element and pair it under this Poincaré duality pairing. That symmetric bilinear form should have a particular signature given by the dimensions of the graded pieces of A. So there are many different objects X, and even for one particular object X, there are many different cohomologies A that you can associate to in a certain natural way, so that it satisfies PD and HL, and also the hodge riemann relation. I'm not sure whether there is a powerful theory, which is so powerful that which explains all the known hart lepschitz theorems and hart riemann relations in a uniform language. But I do sincerely believe that the list of known hart lepschitz theorems and the hart riemann relations will greatly expand in the future. And in each case, it will have an important implication. So the question which I think is important is to where to look for these patterns, because these patterns, like every other pattern, are usually invisible if you don't look for it. But the good thing is that these rather subtle algebraic properties that are hidden behind the object A that are yet to be constructed are usually shows itself reveals itself through a very concrete and explicit numerical inequalities and equalities. So let me show you a one example of that, starting from a very simple observations concerning simple objects, and arrive at the object P and L for a given X. So let me show you bunch of examples, and all my examples will be configuration of points in projective plane. So the slide that you're seeing is my projective plane, and let's say I have four points on the plane in general position. And see if you can spot the hart lepsius property somewhere. What I'm going to do is to connect any two given points by a line, and count how many points and lines there are. So there are six distinct lines joining four points in general position, and the counts here are four and six. The four points determine six lines. But the numbers will going to certainly change if I move the points into special position. So let's say I have moved one of the points into a special position so that it lies on a line and do the same thing. I'm going to join every pair of points by a line and count how many lines there are. This time, you see four lines in the picture. So there are tie between the number of points and the number of lines, four and four. you can do some, try some more interesting configurations. For example, the configuration of all seven points with zero, one coordinates. So this is my picture for those seven points. 
and they are in rather special position. This time, if you connect all the lines, then you see nine lines. You see seven points and nine lines. And you can go on and on. You can pick one of the points and move it into more special position, see how many lines there are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But just for fun, let's do something different. So I'm going to see my configuration of 0, 1 points as a configuration over spec Z, so to speak, and move the parameter in the base line, the spectrum of Z, toward the prime number 2. So, so long as my prime number is not 2, meaning that I'm going to look at my projected plane defined over a field of characteristic P, so long as my characteristic is not equal to 2, you will see the same 7 points and 9 lines. But at the limit where your P is equal to 2, then something interesting happens. The three red points that you see on the picture, at the limit, they are in a line. So the count really changes. So in this case, you again see a tie between the number of points and the number of lines. Seven points determine seven lines on the final plane over a field with two elements. But in whatever case, there is a clear pattern between the two numbers, which is this. No matter which configuration of points you start with, you will always see at least the cardinality of E many lines, where E is my set of points with exactly one exception, which is the case where your entire set of points is contained in a line. So that is an old theorem in enumerative geometry. And I have to admit that I cannot really pronounce that Dutchman's name. So let me just call it the theorem of D, B, and E. So this is, in fact, a hard left shift theorem, or property, so to speak. So we'll get there. But there is no reason to stop at dimension two. We can ask the same question or look for the same type of patterns in higher dimensions. So I'll go one dimension high and again show you some bunch of examples. So this is the most basic configuration in three space. So you start with three-dimensional, say, projective space, and put four points in general position again. You connect every pair by a line, and connect every triple by a plane, and count how many geometric figures you see on the picture. So in this case, you see four points, and six lines, and four planes. So the numbers are four and six and four. Well, I said general, so almost by definition. So the count should be 464. Four. And let's put one more point in general position again, so that the counts are 5 and 10 and 10. You start seeing similar pattern. Of course, I can put my fifth point in more special position so that the count will, do, will change. So if I put my fifth point in one of the planes already determined by the four points, then my count will be 5, 10, and 7. But still, 7 is larger than 5. And the pattern you have seen in the plane case persists. Even if I put my fifth point in very special position so that it lies on a line, I could not beat that inequality. So the count in this case would be 5 and 8 and 5. When Motskin in the early 50s was successful in justifying the counts that we have just seen, it says that 
Every set of points E in a projective space determines at least the cardinality E many hyperplanes in any dimension, except in one case where your entire set E is contained in a hyperplane. So as you can imagine, the statement, there is really distinct statement, at least one for every field. And the original argument, Motskin really used the properties of real numbers. And he only looked at the configuration that you see over the real numbers. But the statement remains true, say, over every field. And this extra assumption of reality was removed by Basterfield and Kelly in the 60s. But again, why stop here? Why would you just compare the number of points and the number of hyperplanes? There are a whole bunch of other numbers in between. And you can ask, what kind of pattern do you see concerning those numbers in between? So, in the notation that I'm going to soon introduce, the theorem of Motzkin that you have seen in the previous slide says that one number, the number of points, is smaller than the other number, the number of hyperplanes determined by the point configuration. Well, that is a theorem, I have told you so, but why is this true? Well, there are so many different reasons why one number can is smaller than the other number. But these are not arbitrary numbers. These are cardinalities of some set. And there is only one reason why the cardinality of one set is smaller than the cardinality of some other set, meaning that there should be an injection from one set to the other set. There are no other reason. And these sets are coming from a geometric configuration, so it's equipped with some extra information. So it is natural from the context to require that the injection that we are seeking from L1 to L to the D minus 1 respects the incidence relations between the points and the hyperplanes, whether there is or is not such an injection. It turns out that it is, and people have succeeded in justifying that fact. A theorem of Green says that, says exactly this. For every point in your point configuration E, you can choose a hyperplane containing the point, one of the hyperplanes determined by the point configuration, so that no hyperplane in the list is chosen twice. Of course, with one obvious exception, again, that E is not contained in any hyperplane. So this is what combinatorialist calls matching. It says that there is a matching from the set of points to the set of hyperplanes under consideration, where a matching is simply an injective map from one set to the other set that respects the inclusion relation. But again, why stop here? So what can you say about those flats or subspaces of dimensions in between? So let me switch uh, from the language of projective geometry to the language of linear algebra. So everything from now on will be linear algebra. So I'm going to fix my E to be a spanning subset of a d-dimensional vector space V over some field. And I'm going to look at the partially ordered set of subspaces of my vector space spanned by all possible subsets of E. So these corresponds to points and lines and planes, etc., that you have seen in the previous pictures. And I'm going to write LP, L sub P, for the set of P-dimensional spaces in my list L. So just to calibrate, here is one example. If my E is the set of four general vectors in all three, then the cardinality of L0 is 1. 
There is only one zero-dimensional space in my list, which is the zero space. And there is four one-dimensional subspaces, because I have four vectors. And there are six two-dimensional spaces. This corresponds to six lines joining four points in the projected plane. And there is one three-dimensional space, the entire R3. So the count in this case is 1, 4, 6, 1. And the theorem of db and e says that 6 is larger than 4. So Dowling and Wilson have conjectured a pattern that generalizes the theorems that you have seen before. It says that for every p, less than d half, so d is the dimension of my ambient vector space, you should have the numerical inequality, which says that the cardinality of LP, the collection of p-dimensional spaces, is at most the cardinality of L to the d minus p. And in fact, there must be a matching, an injective map going from LP to L to the d minus p, which respects the incidence relations. It has the second part, which looks similar. Again, it says that for every p at most d half, the cardinality of lp is at most the cardinality of lp plus 1. And again, in fact, there must be a matching going from lp to the lp plus 1, an injective map going from one to the other, which respects the inclusion relations. So if you write down your sequence of interests, 1, 4, 6, 1, for example, the first part says that if you look at the numbers in complementary position, then one is always larger than the other, and hence the name top-heavy conjecture. And the second part says that the numbers will, at least for the first half, will increase. And it doesn't say anything about the latter half. So let's think about this, pre this predictions for a second. And of course, you will want to start with the most familiar configuration of vectors, namely the d general vectors inside d dimensional space. In, in this case, the subspaces that you will be looking at will be basically everything corresponding to the faces of the simplex. So the poset in this case is the Boolean lattice, 2 to the e, corresponding to all possible subsets of my finite set e. You may be surprised to notice, after 15 seconds maybe, that the assertions or the predictions made in this case is already non-trivial. The numerical predictions are more or less trivial. The numbers of interest here are binomial coefficients, which counts the number of subsets of given size. And of course, if you compare the two numbers in the complementary position, they are same. And it certainly increases up to middle. But the conjecture on the existence of matchings is already somewhat tricky. I would say it, it is non-trivial I would say it takes about a day or two of hard work before any typical person to conclude that this is indeed trivial. So, <laughs> but let me just uh, tell you what the statements are. So what the statement predicts in this case is that if you look at the Boolean poset, there must be an injection from L0 to L1 to L2 to L3, et cetera, all the way up to L to the d half. And there must be an injection from LD, LD minus 1, LD minus 2, et cetera, all the way up to again to the middle by the self-duality of the Boolean lattice. So this is a form of hart lepshire theorem. But there is a... There is a slightly tricky thing here to actually construct these injections. The most obvious difficulty you'll notice is that 
there is no canonical or God-given injections of that type. Well, you will be able to construct it for any given d small enough, and you, you'll scratch in your notepad and construct the injection. But in the process, you will do something artificial. Maybe you will have to order the list of points and do choose something in a random way or something like that. So there is no God-given matchings injections going all the way up to the middle. You have to do something fuzzy. Just to convince you that these existing statements are really something non-trivial, let me tell you one consequence of this. The existence of injections immediately implies what is called the Sperner theorem, perhaps one of the well-known theorems in the extremal set theory. It says that the maximal number of incomparable elements in the Boolean lattice L is the maximum of the cardinality of LP, the largest of the binomial coefficient in question. Why does the existence of matching imply Sperner theorem? Because let's say you have an anti-chain or the, max, the incomparable collection of subsets of my ground set E, spread it all over my lattice L. If I know that the injections that I'm seeking for exist, I can use those injections to push all each element in my collection, the anti-chain, all the way to the middle. And it will remain an anti-chain, a collection of incomparable subsets. And therefore, the largest possible cardinality of such a collection should be the cardinality of LD half. And you might want to test this conjecture for somewhat more interesting lattices. And that has been done for partition lattices by Joseph Kuhn. This is the partially ordered set of all partitions of a finite set ordered by refinement relation, essentially. And you can realize this post set by carefully putting vectors in a vector space. But already in this case, there is something interesting. Long time ago, Canfield famously showed that the following stronger version of the conjecture, which was once expected to be true, fails even for this very nice post set. The stronger version of the statement says that for every p, there is a matching from LP to LP plus 1, or LP plus 1 to LP. So Ignoring the direction, it predicts the matching going in, <clears throat> in between any two successive ranks. And the one reason why this example was famous is, first, uh, many, many people believe this uh, general uh, matching existence property to be true, at least for partition lattices. And secondly, because of its enormous size. And the smallest known partition lattice without this property has size 10 to the 10 to the 20. So a number very, very close to infinity. <laughs> and certainly, you will not find a counterexample to that statement for 10, 11, 12, or things like that. I, that's what's known. That's what I know. But maybe people haven't really tried hard to reduce the number. Yeah. So, I mean, from my perspective, this. So, what is happening is at the top half. So there is a matching from L0, L1, and L1 to L2. Everything is fine until the middle, and then something crazy starts happening from that point on. So from my perspective, all these crazy phenomenon are caused by certain singularities. So hard Lepshire theorem is fine up to the middle. But when, and it, it will going to be fine all the way if your object is smooth in some sense. And this is what's happening in the Boolean lattice, where you even see the presence of Poincare duality which says that this binomial coefficient is equal to that other binomial coefficient. 
but when you have singularities in your structure, something interesting may happen at the top half. But still, you can say something. So this is what we proved, uh, what I proved with Boton Wang at uh, Wisconsin Madison. And we used a certain version of hart lapsus property to show that the conjecture that I showed you before holds for all possible vector configurations. But I should add that this, this does not conclude the story. Actually, the original conjecture was not about vector configuration. It concerned a certain lattices, lattices in the sense of POSA theory, that satisfies axiom this, this, and that. So these collect this class of lattices are called geometric lattices in the sense of Barkov, the Sun Bar Barkov. And you can formulate the same conjecture, and it is still expected to be true for arbitrary geometric lattices, not necessarily coming from vector configuration over some field. So what we can do at the moment is to prove this conjecture when my poset L is realizable over some field. By ch carefully choosing a field, vector space, and carefully choosing a configuration to realize my lattice. But I do expect that the hard lesser theorem that we are using to prove this conjecture in the realizable case will remain true for arbitrary geometric lattice. And that is for uh, one example of a hard lapsus property out there that's somehow within reach. So it's a some co purely combinatorial statement that we should be able to prove. So let me give you rough idea how the hard lapsus property comes in. And this outline also somehow explains the fuzzy construction in the case of Boolean lattices that you had to do. So sometimes you have to construct things in a fuzzy way, but some other times it just says that there's some other structure that is got given and you should be able to work with that some other structure. And that some other structure in our case is this. So I start with my poset L, the poset of all subspaces spanned by subcollection of vectors in my configuration. And I'm going to associate a commutative algebra, a finite dimensional graded commutative algebra that I'm going to write by B. As a vector space, it's something very, very simple. So piece graded piece of my algebra is simply the vector space with basis one for each P dimensional subspace in my collection. So the dimension of piece graded piece is the cardinality of LP what I noted before. And the structure comes in, of course, how I define the multiplication here. It is also very simple. I only have to define how to multiply two basis elements, y1 and y2, each representing subspaces in my collection. And I declare that the multiplication is y1 join y2 if the dimension of y1 as a subspace plus the dimension of y2 as a subspace is equal to the dimension of y1 join y2. Here, of course, join means the span of y1 and y2. So if y1 and y2 are somehow in a general position, I would declare that the span is the result of the multiplication. If otherwise, there's a defect in the dimension, I would say that the multiplication is 0. So this is a graded version of what is called the Mabius algebra in combinatorics. But unlike in the classical case, this graded version of the Mabius algebra has a very interesting structure. So this algebra is, comes with a one very interesting element, namely the sum of all the elements in L1, the sum of all vectors in my configuration. That's a degree one element in my algebra. Let me call it L, and the statement that we are going to uh, see is that 
the repeated multiplication by this particular degree one element L defines an injection from B to the P to the B to the D minus P. So it's not quite a bijection, as in the hart lapshet theorem, but it's still an injection. And the failure of the surge activity is again caused by singularities in this structure, at least when L is realizable over some field. But let me pause here and show you why the injectivity of this particular linear map gives you what you want. I conjecture that the same holds without the assumption of realizability. So this is a purely combinatorial statement that you can ask about any abstract pose at L. So to do that, let me write down, let's imagine that we are writing down the matrix for that linear map. This makes perfect sense because both the source and the target are equipped with a canonical choice of basis. So p-dimensional spaces on the row, d minus p-dimensional spaces on the column. By the way I have defined the multiplication, the entries of this matrix will have a particular zero, non-zero pattern. Every entry will be going to be labeled by pairs of elements of L, and the, all the entries corresponding to incomparable pairs will be going to be zero. If we know that this matrix defines an injective map, we know that it has a full rank. So there must be a non-zero maximal minor. So let's pick one, any one non-zero maximal minor. There may be many. And this is one source of the fuzziness that you have seen in the case of Boolean lattices. And after picking up any one non-zero maximal minor of this matrix, are going to evaluate the determinant of that square submatrix. It will be non-zero because I have chosen it that way. So in the standard expansion of this non-zero determinant, there must be a non-zero term. But every term corresponds to a permutation of the column levels and row levels. And the permutation corresponding to this non-zero term will produce the matching I. So an injective map going from the set of p-dimensional spaces to this collection of d minus p-dimensional spaces. In other words, I can look, choose a sub-collection of d minus p-dimensional spaces so that there is a bijection between the collection of p-dimensional spaces and this sub-collection. So, and while it preserves the incidence relation. So this proves the first part of the top-heavy conjecture. And the second part can be justified in a similar way. OK, so the remaining question is to how to prove some map, a linear map, is injective. This is usually a rather delicate uh, problem. And it is also at the heart of this particular problem, too. And it is where we have to rely on the known facts in algebraic geometry. But the statement itself is purely combinatorial, and we should be able to somehow justify this. But anyway, in the realizable case, this is how the argument goes. To show that this particular linear map, the iterated multiplication by L, is injective, what we're going to show, uh, what we will do is to construct a map between smooth projective varieties, say F. It goes from X to Y, and X has dimension D, and Y has the cardinality, dimension which is equal to the cardinality of E my vector space configuration. This map F is designed in such a way that it is birational onto its image, 
and it realizes the combinatorial algebra B that I was talking about as a pullback image of the singular cohomology. So I have my F going from X to Y. It induces a pullback in a suitable cohomology theory, say a singular cohomology if everything is defined over the complex numbers. If your configuration lives over characteristic P, you may want to choose the LRD cohomology. But in any case, our B of L is the pullback image of the singular cohomology of this, under this map of smooth projected varieties. And the distinguished degree one element L is ample on the target Y. And this is where the magic happens. So I'm not going to pretend that everybody in this room knows what this is, but um, let me at least read it. So by, by the decomposition theorem, so there is a isomorphism between two objects. On one side, you have this thing, all f star of a qx. And the other side, you see a ic, i for intersection and c for cohomology of the image and some other junk. So some object obtained by pushing forward through f decompose into two parts. They are, in fact, the complexes of sheaves. And in the decomposition, you see two things. There is a C that you don't care about. Let me call it junk. And this other thing that's somehow canonically associated to the image variety, F of X. And you can take the cohomology of both objects and deduce that, deduce the well-known fact that the cohomology, <coughs> intersection cohomology of the fx appears as a direct sum end of the, uh, appears as a sub-object of the usual cohomology of the source, x. But the reason why I have wrote down that isomorphism at the level of sheaves is that every inclusion that you see here uh, produced by the decomposition theorem is, in fact, not any injection, but a module homomorphism with respect to the pullback of the cohomology rings. And therefore, what you can conclude is that the, our algebra B is, in fact, isomorphic to a HY submodule of what is called the intersection cohomology of the image. What do you mean by isomorphic? Intersection cohomology of FX. Fx is not y. Onto its image, which is fx. So y is y will going to be smooth, but fx will going to have singularities, and that's where the interesting informations are. But then we can appeal to the known fact that the intersection cohomology of a projective variety satisfies a hard Lebesgue property. But of course, our algebra B L is not the whole intersection cohomology. It consists of a certain small piece inside. But one of the remarkable properties of, not remarkable, but valuable properties of injective map is that it restricts to injective maps. So if you have an injective map going from here to here, and you have a sub-object, then it will, the restriction will be remain injective. The same will certainly not be true for surjective maps, and that's why we lose the surjectivity. So that's where the injectivity comes from, at least in the realizable case. But of course, the fact that we can only prove this injectivity in the case when our geometric lattice or post set is realizable over some field is an indication that one, we don't really understand how to prove decomposition theorem and hard lepsha th theorem, even in this very simple setting. And two, that there must be a combinatorial version of decomposition theorem and the intersection cohomology hard lepsha theorem, which should apply to this more broad setting for concerning combinatorial objects not coming over any field. So, in fact, if you, can, if you work a little bit harder, then what you can show is that 
In fact, this algebra B that I was talking about is the, actually the whole singular cohomology of the image, fx. And this is a side remark, but I learned, this is one thing valuable that I learned while pursuing this project. So some algebraic geometers, like me, um, are somewhat reluctant to multiply two things in the cohomology of a projective variety when your variety is singular. I don't know why, but I didn't want to really multiply two things when the, I had singularities. But this, this changed my mind. So even when my fx has rather large singular locus, it was extremely helpful to look at the multiplicative structure inside the usual cohomology. And the multiplication rule is not something crazy. It's given by a very simple and nice formula. And it gave me the information that I wanted. So, so I hope that there's some other cases like this. So let me very quickly show you how you would construct this map. So of course, this is where all the tricks lies. And it is one of those things uh, such that if you know what to prove, then it's not too hard to, not too hard to prove this. So I'm going to show you uh, the same picture uh, again in the next lecture in a slightly different context. But essentially, Everything is induced by this single picture uh, between the relation between three polytopes. So what I'm saying is that there is a universal construction of the desired map F, which is independent of the point configuration that you started. If, and this is the construction corresponding to the case of Boolean lattice. And if you understand the, this trivial case of Boolean lattice, then it will, the construction will induce every other case of interest, at least when your L is realizable over some field. So on one side, you see a simplex. And you certainly know very well about simplices. And on the other side, you see a cube. And you also know very well about cubes. But you may have not seen the object in between. So that is a polytope which goes under the name of permutohedron. And somehow, it connects the simplex and the cube in an interesting way. And the construction I have in mind is this, which happens in the category of toric varieties. So on one side, I have the variety p to the n corresponding to a simplex. And on the other side, I have the variety p1 to the n, which corresponds to the cube. There is a variety in the middle that I'm going to write by xan, which corresponds to the permutohedron. And it comes equipped with the map to the pn and map to the p1 to the n. Everything is toric. And uh, Sorry? So Cn, I'm going to identify an open subset of Pn, which is a Cn, with another Cn, which lives inside P1 to the n. So that corresponds to the choice of the red markings on one of the vertex of the simplex and the other. So I'm breaking the symmetry just a little bit. So the first map pi 1 is the blow up of all points in Pn, torus invariant points, and the blow up of all the strict transforms of lines in Pn, and blow up of all the strict transforms of P2s in Pn, and et cetera. And the second map pi 2 has similar description. It is the blow up of two points, 0 to the n and infinity to the n. And all the strict transform of P1s containing 0 to the n or infinity to the n. And all the strict transforms of p1 to the 2 
containing 0 to the n or infinity to the n. I'm essentially telling you how to construct a permutohedron by cutting off simplex and cutting off a cube. For simplex, you cut off all the vertices, you cut off all the edges, and so on, and you arrive at the permutohedron. For the cube, you pick two antipodal points, cut off them, cut off all the edges, meeting the, the two points, and so on. And all these blow-up maps uh, somehow induces the, the map F that we are looking for. So you start from a vector configuration E, so F1 to F2 to F dot N. So there are N vectors, which you think of it as an inclusion of the dual vector space of V into the CN. And I think of CN as an open subset of PN and P1 to the N and take the closure of my linear space V, or V, v check to be precise, inside these two toric varieties. Inside Pn, I get just d-dimensional subs linear subspace. Inside P1 to the n, I get a variety with interesting singularities, but not that horrible. And there will going to be the corresponding variety also in the permutohedron, and the map F we want is the composition going from X to the permutohedron, projecting down to P1 to the N. And once you have guessed the, correctly guessed the case of Boolean lattices, which somehow manifests itself in the form of P1 to the N, because the Betty numbers of the P1 to the N are exactly the binomial coefficients that we have seen. And somehow the structure of the multiplication in the P1 to the N, as you can see, somehow respects the inclusion relations in the, this trivial case, the Boolean lattice. And the pullback map F exactly kills those cohomology classes which does not correspond to a span of a subspace. So uh, let me stop here. And in the next lecture, I'm going to show you some other examples and many more known examples of the hard Lepschetz properties and Hodge-Riemann relations, focusing this time more on the Hodge-Riemann relations part. Thank you.